Hey YouTube, imagine what you could do with the right piece of information. Say you had a safe in front of you, a small one, and inside of it was $10,000 cold hard cash that was yours free and clear if you could figure out the combination to the safe. You're even given a head start, you're given the first two digits of the combination, and you just have to find the third. Do you think you'd stick around and try every possible combination until you got that last number? Probably. Because that one piece of information is worth $10,000 cold hard cash. But what if you went in the other direction? What if you had a piece of information and you had to figure out why that piece of information was important? Or, more profoundly, you had to make that piece of information important. Make it worth $10,000. Now we're talking about something completely different. For context, let me just take these cards, shuffle them up, and then hold them out. And let me ask you, what can you tell me about the cards in my hands? The truth is, probably not much, but if we rewind, take these cards, shuffle them up, could you tell me what the bottom card is? You see, what you just did right there is called a peek. You're gathering information about a particular card and its position in the deck. And that piece of information, in magic speak, we call a key card. And there have been volumes written about how to utilize that information, that key card, to create some pretty fantastic magical effects. But the gathering of that information, the peak itself, is the more interesting aspect because it has two things about it that are really important. Number one, it's incomplete. And number two, it's indirect. It's incomplete because as I'm shuffling, I'm not trying to gather the value and position of every card in the deck, just that bottom one. And it's indirect because it's creating a dual reality, a discrepancy between the perceived intent of the action and the actual intent. When the audience sees me shuffling, the best guess is that I'm trying to mix the cards. But from my point of view, I'm doing it so that I can peek that bottom card and find its value. You see, it's that discrepancy, that difference between the dual realities that allows the space for a magical effect. So let me show you one of my favorites that utilizes the concept of a key card. So the trick goes something like this. I shuffle the cards, and then I ask the spectator to cut about half the deck toward themselves, and then we both spread our packets in front of each other. We both peel the card out from the spread pack, set it on top, making sure to memorize it, and then we cut it into the middle of the pack. They do likewise. Now, I say that I peaked the Ace of Diamonds. They say that they peaked the Five of Hearts. And I say that I can scare my card out from my packet to theirs if I just snap fast enough and loud enough. And then when I show the contents of my packet, you'll see that my Ace of Diamonds is nowhere to be found. But if we spread their packet, you'll see that my Ace of Diamonds is right next to their Five of Hearts. The concept is pretty simple. I peek the bottom card and then I shuffle it to the top of the deck. When they cut the cards toward themselves, my card is now sitting on top, the two of clubs. When we spread our cards, I peek a card, but I don't bother memorizing it because I'm going to miscall the card that I spotted by saying it's the two of clubs, leading to the illusion that it's over here. They spot a card, the queen of diamonds, and then they cut the pack, but what they have done is placed their card on top of my two of clubs. Then I say that I will scare my two of clubs out of my packet by snapping loud enough and hard enough. And when I spread, the two of clubs was never originally in my packet, so it's nowhere to be found. And when they spread, the two of clubs is now exactly where you would expect it to be, right next to their queen of diamonds. That routine is called the Nervous Card by S.H. Sharp. It's the only time I've ever heard it referenced. It was originally published in Encyclopedia of Card Tricks, edited by Gene Hugard, which is a magnificent book. And there's an entire section in there on the key card principle, but it's not the only place that you could go looking. Like I said, there are volumes written about this concept, but I do think it's the capturing and utilization of this tiny piece of information that should give the people who create these routines a lot more credit. Say you already had that routine in mind. You already know the effect that you want to create and the only thing that you need is the value and position of that particular key card. Well, now we're very close to that first example that I gave you with the safe. You already know the value that's waiting at the other end. You just need that last piece of information. In fact, that's why we call it the key card because it unlocks the entire scenario. But what if instead we go in the other direction? What if I just gave you randomly the position and value of a single card in the deck and told you that you had to create a routine from scratch? See, now that's something much more impressive and much more like the second example that I gave you, where you're trying to create value from a single piece of information. 
You see, in order to pull off something like that, you have to bring to bear some serious creativity, abstract reasoning, logical inference, and extrapolation. You have to use inductive, deductive, and abductive reasoning and bring all of that in just to create a routine that's worthwhile. So if I asked you to do that, you might think all of that sounds really intimidating, except you've likely already done something like that. You've encountered this in a completely different context, if you've ever played Sudoku. There's a quote from a book called The Sign of Four. It's a Sherlock Holmes book written back in 1890, where Sherlock frustratingly says, how often have I told you that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. There is legitimately no better description for Sudoku than that sentence, because them's the rules. The rules of Sudoku are pretty easy to describe because it's a bunch of nines flying around everywhere. You start off with a nine by nine grid, so 81 squares, collected into nine cells of nine squares each. And then you're given nine numbers that you can place into that grid nine different times. But there is one caveat. No number can repeat itself in any row, column, diagonal, or cell of nine squares. But even with that caveat, there's still something like six and change hextillion possible valid arrangements of those numbers in that grid that still follow all the rules of Sudoku. Which incidentally is why they can keep printing Sudoku books and they're not likely to run out of valid scenarios. See, in order for a Sudoku to be a puzzle though, what they do is they start with a fully filled out grid and then they start removing numbers all over the place and leave you with clues, numbers that have been left on the grid and ask you to use logic and the rules of Sudoku to reverse engineer what the original grid would have looked like. So let me give you an extreme example. Say I handed you a Sudoku puzzle where almost everything is filled in except for a single square. It wouldn't be much of a puzzle. For you, it would just be a simple process of elimination. But it turns out I could go pretty aggro, removing numbers off of my arrangement and handing it to you, and you could just follow the rules of logic and the rules of Sudoku in order to reverse engineer my original arrangement. But there is a lower limit. Eventually, I would hit the point where if I tried to remove one more number, I could not guarantee that if you solved that Sudoku puzzle, you would end at the arrangement that I originally intended. So that last number represents the minimum amount of information required to communicate my arrangement in Sudoku. Now, every single arrangement of those nine numbers in those 81 squares has this built in, this minimum amount of information that has to be left on the board in order for you to reverse engineer the original arrangement. Incidentally, the lowest number is 17. You would need at least 17 numbers on that board in order to generate somewhere around 49,000 guaranteed arrangements. So if you wanted to find any of the other arrangements, you'd have to add information, something greater than 17. But if you looked at all of this from 10,000 feet up and removed the vocabulary, this looks an awful lot like information theory. It looks like compression. Now, information theory got kicked off back in the 1920s, but it found its Einstein in the 1940s with a guy named Claude Shannon, personal hero of mine, thinker extraordinaire, father of the information age. And he got kicked off with a paper called A Mathematical Theory of Communication, where this guy pulls from everywhere, statistics, physics, thermodynamics, all of it, in order to help us understand the concept of compression. That every form of communication once sent out always has redundancies built into it, and that you could remove those redundancies and still have the essential meaning communicated for the other end to be able to understand. And it is now how the entire digital world works. From the phone calls you make, to the music you listen to, to the video that you're watching right now, all of it relies on the concept of compression. And the concepts that Claude Shannon set out are still being studied and argued about to this day. They are still creating new forms of math to try to describe the most efficient way to compress things like sounds and videos and pictures and ideas so that the other side can take that single kernel and rebuild it into the original object. And that's the hunt. It's the hunt for the essential. It's the hunt for the right piece of information to be able to rebuild something on the other end that's meaningful. It's like looking at those six hex telling different possibilities of a Sudoku board and knowing that all of them, despite the variance, could be reduced, each of them, to a few numbers on the board and from those numbers be able to rebuild the pattern perfectly. It's like knowing the value and position of a single card in the deck and from that single piece of information be able to build something beautiful like a magical experience. That is the power of the right piece of information. Whew. Anyway, key cards, they're amazing. If you guys are new here, this is what this channel is like. I try to upload videos like this, interesting topics about magic and all the things that inform it at least once a week. So I hope you come back for more. To everyone who has been here the entire time, thank you guys so much for the comments, for the feedback, for the encouragement. In the meantime, I'll see you guys soon.